Hello, you're listening to Search for Truth, your 15-minute programme of Bible teaching and hymn singing. So a very warm welcome to you and thanks for joining us. Brian, our Bible teacher, continues his talks on finding pictures of Christ in the Old Testament by looking at another of the sacrifices and festivals which the Old Testament Israelites celebrated. The Old Testament contains many, many prophetic illustrations which speak to us of Christ. And this time, our subject is the ashes of a red heifer, as mentioned in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 13. Here's Brian to tell us more. Thanks, John. A popular form of television drama involves some kind of plot surrounding a mysterious murder that's taken place. And so we have a whole genre of so-called murder mysteries. But did you know that how to deal with unsolved murders is the subject of a detailed ritual to be found in the Old Testament of the Bible? Central to the ritual is a young cow, nearly full-grown, likely not yet to have given birth to a calf, and it also hadn't yet been harnessed as a working animal. But perhaps the most striking part of the ritual was a hand-washing ceremony. Starting from where the victim's body was discovered, measurements were taken to determine which city was nearest. At some river valley in its locality, and under the supervision of priests, the city elders were to kill the cow and then ritually wash their hands over it, all the while declaring they had neither knowledge of nor involvement in the murder in question. And it seems that over time, this symbolic way of maintaining innocence may have been adopted or adapted by others, all the way down to the time of Pilate, the Roman governor responsible for trying Jesus. By his mimicry of hand-washing, Pilate's guilt was not absolved, although it remained less than the guilt incurred by the Jewish religious leaders. In any case, the murder most foul that resulted from lawless and wicked persons nailing Jesus Christ to a Roman cross is actually capable, in the mystery of divine love, of washing away the foulest stains. Let's now come to how it all unfolded at the cross. There's a Bible text, and it's found in Hebrews 9 and verse 13, that says, If the ashes of a heifer or young cow, sprinkling those who have been defiled, Sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Who wouldn't want that? To have a conscience cleansed before God from wrong and even from wrong ways of trying to obtain God's approval. The type of animal that's again being referred to here is a heifer or young cow. This time, a much closer analogy is being made with the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. The analogy is in fact being drawn from a different Old Testament ritual to the one mentioned earlier. Long ago, in Israel, people had to be ceremonially clean before they could engage in serving the Holy Creator God. They understood from the law given through Moses that such a thing as coming into contact with a dead body would disqualify them from any service connected with the temple unless they took the required action. And that required action involved the actual sacrifice this time of a so-called red heifer that was burnt to ashes. Later, those ashes were mixed into water that was later sprinkled on anyone who had suffered defiling contact. We read about all this in the Bible book of Numbers, chapter 19, where it's called a sin offering, one that made purification of sins. Now, I can't seem to recall any other blood sacrifice associated with the temple that wasn't actually offered at its altar, but rather took place outside of the camp of Israel. It's true that the remains of selected sin offerings were disposed of by burning at a spot outside the camp. But the sacrifice of the red heifer cow itself took place there. The Bible letter to the Hebrews describes Jesus' death by Roman crucifixion as taking place outside the camp, outside the city gate of Jerusalem, Hebrews 13 verse 12. It's possible to read from a 2nd century Jewish commentary where it talks of a double-tiered bridge 
spanning the Kidron Valley around the time of Jesus' death. It seems, and I'm quoting, they made a causeway from the Temple Mount to the Mount of Olives. By it, the priest that was to burn the heifer and the heifer and all that aided him went forth to the Mount of Olives. End quote. And a rabbi says this, quoting again, the heifer was prepared on the Mount of Olives, directly opposite the eastern entrance to the sanctuary. End quote. Remember how Mark in his Gospel, chapter 13, verse 3, once described Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. This leads us naturally to think again about exactly where Jesus might have died. If Jesus did die on the Mount of Olives, where the heifer was then burned, this would link up directly with Christ as the firstfruits. In fact, it's appealing in the sense of that location connecting so many events. Think of them, I'm recalling his triumphal entry, his Gethsemane prayer, his arrest, crucifixion, burial, resurrection, his ascension, and his return to earth. You know, traditional, time-honoured, suggested sites for the death of Jesus are based on superstition and sentiment. It does, however, seem possible to pick up some clues direct from Scripture itself in relation to this red heifer ceremony. We read in the Bible that between the slaughtering and the burning of the young red heifer cow, the high priest had to sprinkle by hand some of its blood towards the front of the tent of meeting, in which direction he was clearly looking at that time. That's found in Numbers 19 verse 4. So if this was a foretaste, a mere anticipation of what Jesus himself was going to fulfil, does it not then seem reasonable? if not necessary, to conclude that the position of the cross of Jesus had to be east of the temple, in line of sight, such that the priest officiating over any literal red heifer sacrifice in those days, while distant at the place of its sacrifice, could still see the temple door and throw the blood towards it. Matthew in his Gospel takes us to the ultimate sacrifice of God's Son, Jesus, that had always been symbolised in the offering of the red heifers. He narrates the event like this. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Also the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now as for the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the other things that were happening, they became extremely frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. That's Matthew 27 from verse 50. It reads there as if the torn temple curtain was seen by the centurion and those with him just as the priests from ancient times were required to see the temple door at the time of the special red heifer sacrifice that Jesus was here fulfilling. As graphically described in the Bible book of Ezekiel, the glory of God visibly retreated by moving eastwards from the temple as a previous judgment upon the chronic disobedience of God's people. If Jesus was led out of Jerusalem heading towards the Mount of Olives on the east, he would be following the same path of God's previous forsaking of the temple back in Ezekiel's time. God's house was once again left desolate of God's presence at the time of the cross, also a God-forsaken place. On southern Mount Olives, we find the Silwan Necropolis, that is, it's a place of graves. Now, we've read Matthew saying that nearby graves were opened when Jesus died as the red heifer. And on that site to this day, as can be verified from photographic evidence, tombs remain exposed where the limestone roof structure had once split and exposed an escarpment with only the back half of the grave cavities remaining, now open to the elements. Dating indications suggest the timing would fit that of the crucifixion. 
it would seem worthwhile then to dig out a little more information about the place where the red heifer was slaughtered at a ceremonially clean place, considered to be an extension of the temple, but on the Mount of Olives. To this spot, the red heifer was led alive by the high priest and the other priests eastward through the mustering gate, Nehemiah 3.31, and it led on to a place just outside the camp of Israel. The description of this gate would seem to fit with it being said to be a census point, even where a head count for the payment of the temple tax occurred. Could this account for the naming of Jesus' crucifixion site being in terms of a skull or head? After all, it was a per capita tax or a poll tax. And as a mustering station, it would satisfy the observation that the cross was at a place where people could gather. The route between this spot and the city was a main access route, such that there could be, and indeed there were, many witnesses to the death of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago outside of Jerusalem. The main road into Jerusalem during the time of Jesus, which descended from the Mount of Olives from the east, heading to the west, came right past the Silwan village with its now opened tombs. In Nancy Cool's book, The Trials and Execution of Jesus, she agrees that this mustering gate gave access to a bridge by which criminals were led to their death. The red heifer was also led across this bridge, going east from the temple, across the Kidron Valley, to its final place of slaughter. How much then the phrase, the ashes of a heifer, may have to tell us. As usual, I remind you of the advantage of getting the transcript book of all the talks in this series. It's available online and either you can get it yourself by downloading a copy from churchesofgod.info forward slash media. Alternatively, you can request a hard copy book by asking for the title Christ in the Old Testament. So don't forget to include your postal address so we know where to send it. You can use email or the post, and here's our address. Search for Truth, Hayes Press, The Barn, Flaxlands, Royal Wootton Bassett, Swindon, SN4, 8DY, UK. Our email address is sft at churchesofgod.info. It's time to say how much we've enjoyed your company today, because we've almost reached the end of today's programme. So many thanks for taking time to be with us. But do join us again next week for the next talk in this series on Christ in the Old Testament. This time it's called The Bronze or the Brass Serpent, as found in John's Gospel, chapter 3 and verse 14. So I look forward to your company then. So until next time... It's goodbye and very best wishes from our Bible teacher, Brian, our producer, David, our singers and me, John. So see you again soon. And in the meantime, we wish you God's richest blessings. He died.